Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. Man, I'll say putting on weight is so much easier than losing it. And I know that's a revelation for a lot of people, but it is so stupid. And I know I've said this before to you guys like 15 minutes ago. It is so stupid sitting on the same bike for two weeks and I don't see a single thing different about my body. Evan put it perfectly. You look the same. You look like the same kind of milk bag and you just feel worse. Oh, yeah. I'm totally in the same boat. I am dreading the first day back at the gym. And that's probably why I put it off indefinitely. Because I'm just going to look awful. I'm going to feel awful. And for a week and a half after, I'm not going to be able to move. Worse is when someone records you. Like uh, either a video is taken of you and you see yourself on the camera afterwards. And you're like, oh, my God. When you're not in full control of the angle at which you're viewing yourself, you're like, wow, I put on that much weight, huh? Yeah, that's what I look like, Brad. (laughs) There's only a couple angles that I feel comfortable looking at myself at. And most of the time when I see myself, it's not in those angles and I'm just disgusted. (laughs) Yeah. It didn't help that we have a world-class professional women's hockey player on today talking about her training regimen. And I was just like, oh my God. (laughs) The funniest part was when she was talking about how they have to go from like Calgary back to Toronto and have to work the next day. I'm like, I go to beer league at like nine o'clock at night and I'm crippled the next day. (laughs) Like I can't really move. I'm sleep deprived. So I, I have no excuses anymore. When vacations used to be a thing, I used to book a day on either end off from work to recover. Yeah, me too. Even (laughs) Even if I I got back, even if I, even if I got back home on a Saturday, I'd still take the Monday off. So I still had those two days to figure myself out. I can sense Brad is waiting to say something. No, I am very actively trying to not say anything right now. Why? Are you saying I look fat? No, no, no. Just, um, you know, I come from a a, a gym personal training background. So I have have some thoughts that don't necessarily line up with what you were saying there. (laughs) But I wanted I wanted I wanted you to let your bit run. That's uh that's not anything new to the winged wheel podcast. Brad having thoughts that differ from one <laughs> or both of us. <laughs> oh man. Off season episodes somehow find themselves becoming more and more full uh than sometimes regular season episodes when, you know, the Red Wings were in the middle of another five game losing streak. Uh but yeah, this episode is jam packed. We have things to talk about within the Red Wing sphere. Um, you know, mostly rumors and a minor move that is major to some uh we have news about the world junior championships we have oh i just punched my mic shouldn't do that uh we have an interview with a friend one of brad's good friends and uh like i said professional women's hockey player lauren gable uh which was a really fun interview uh to do and then there's of course news of the nhl um being on track to return with a big old grain of salt so yeah you we save these for the uh the sundays the one a weeks and then the news tends to pile up over the week when we're not expecting it and here we are so dimitro timashov um not surprising and to some people they don't really care but i, I think for me at least a little disappointing uh knowing that it was probably going to end up this way but he was traded to the islanders for effectively nothing um dimitro timashov from detroit to the islanders in exchange for <clears throat> future considerations the pronoun um which means this isn't a move where detroit gets anything in return they're literally just moving his rights because there's no future for him in detroit um some context in the flurry of all of the uh, signings that eisman made when um everything opened back up uh, our free agency opened up back in october november i can't remember um someone asked him about Timoshov and he said we floated an offer to him we told him where he fits on this team he's considering his options you can read between the lines there they weren't offering him significant money and they weren't offering him significant term they essentially viewed him the same way they viewed a lot of their other depth players at the bottom six of the roster um I wouldn't be surprised if he 
the number or the term was so low that there's no way he would have considered Detroit. Um, but Eisman seems pretty firm in his uh, plan. Um, it wasn't a shock. Would have been nice to have him because I was really pumped about that waiver pickup. It was the exact kind of move you want to see Eisman make. But anytime you have a GM that goes out and signs as many players as he did to kind of fill up the roster, these are going to be the casualties, so to speak. Yeah, get him for nothing, lose him for nothing. It was a fine experiment. I mean, I liked him better than some of the guys that will be in the lineup. I I would have preferred him over an Adam Ernie, a Franz Nielsen, and and given their contract status, honestly, Darren Helmer, Luke Lindenning. Not necessarily that he's better than those two, but you know, age relative to contract, etc. Um, that being said, he's he was going to be a career bottom six player with the outside chance that he could fill in on the second line as needed because he was pretty talented um not the highest hockey iq in the world but he, he he flashed a little bit um in his brief stint with detroit but yeah if he wanted more than like much more than league minimum he wasn't getting it in detroit if he wanted term he wasn't getting it in detroit if he wanted a guaranteed top nine role he wasn't getting it in detroit so i mean sure i i'm sure the future considerations is based on some like insanely unattainable uh, goal we'll call it like oh if he scores 40 points next year we'll give you a seventh round pick or something like that so uh there was some conspiracy theories floating around that maybe it's because eisenman wanted to get a contract uh slot opened up in case he wanted to swing a big deal with tampa or somebody else which there have been rumors about those floating around so maybe that has something to do with it. I don't put too much weight in that because I don't think Detroit was up against the contract limit or even particularly close to it. I could be wrong, Um, but eh, it is, it is what it is. And it was fun. Now it's over. Yeah. It wasn't a, he wasn't a needle mover one way or the other. So like you said, got him for nothing, lose him for nothing. So, you know, it would have been nice to see, uh, maybe a little bit more out of them if they could sign them and get them into the top nine, but clearly they don't think that's possible. So you move on from guys like that. Um, kind of off topic here. One of the memes going around about the show is um, Ryan says the phrase, uh, I'm not referring to myself in the third person. I'm just kind of paraphrasing. Is Ryan says the phrase, I'm not going to repeat everything Brad just said. And then I carry on to repeat everything Brad just said. And now I'm trying to be so conscious about using different words. Um, and so this at this point, I'm just going to say, yeah, what Brad said. <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. Like, uh, I, I know a piece of criticism that a lot of people, I saw this discussion going around, which is that you know, a lot of people were super excited about Timoshov and how can you say now that he's not a needle mover if you're so excited about him? And I don't think those things are mutually exclusive. Um, I don't think he like he's not a needle mover in terms of like the grand scheme of the 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 rebuild. Like, you know, in 10 years when Detroit's won however many cups because of Eisenman's architecture of this team, Timoshov's name isn't going to be the headliner on that. Or if he had stated, he, it wouldn't have been the headliner on that. Um but yeah, a world where there's no Nielsen or or uh, Ernie or whoever else filling up that those bottom six roles, I think there's a, a world where he would have become a more memorable depth player. I mean, if Red Wings fans are good at anything, it's immortalizing depth players. Like just as much as we're good at immortalizing the Eisenmans and the Datsuks, we're good at immortalizing the f- whatever ever depth player people are just absolutely obsessed with. Alexei Marchenko. <laughs> <laughs> remember him me neither so uh yeah for anyone hoping future considerations is anything i hate to get your hopes down or hopes or i hate to let you down but uh it won't be so best of luck to dimitri timoshov and um congratulations to all of you who wanted to make roster projections but we're having a hard time leaving him off uh speaking of rumors the another kick up of um the Zetterberg, Tyler Johnson, Detroit, Tampa Bay swap. Um, not one for one, but just a, a deal involving those two contracts have uh, come up from none other than Elliot Friedman. He acknowledged that this started in Europe, but he's you know been hearing that buzz more and more. And it's interesting. Like, it's interesting because you would traditionally think, yeah, the Zetterberg contract is one that a team would want to offload. But because it's an LTIR contract worth that much, it 
in a way, if for a team that's very careful about how they use it against the cap, it can be a benefit for them because they can LTIR that money and it gives them cap relief in a sense. So am I wrong about that? Like, I'm just trying to wrap my head around this. I don't understand the benefit to Tampa here. The only reason to unload a contract like this or for Detroit to unload a contract like this would be because... Well, two reasons. One, it's an uninsured contract and they're actually paying it. Like, hence when uh, Nathan Horton's contract got traded to Toronto. But I don't think if Detroit signed a contract that long, that would be the issue. I think it's because you're only allowed to go 10% over the cap in the offseason. And the only way that makes sense to send Zetterberg to Tampa is if Detroit's planning on going 10% over the cap in the off season, because Zetterberg's LTIR could not apply until day one, game one. So if this rumor is true, the only logical uh, theory to take out of this is that Iserman's swinging big. He is going for a grand contract. He is not going for a small contract or he's going for multiple grand contracts. And, and I mean, it could be Kalorn and Johnson and another move. I don't know, but he's going to be doing a lot if it's to be believed. Oh, is that a uh, break and entry from Mika? She was uh, pretty subtle about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell by the door rattling. Yeah, no, it's it's hard to make left and right of this because as Brad alluded to, there's so many different economic factors that we wouldn't be considering in a normal NHL where owners aren't worried about, um, where owners are worried about like how much money they're actually paying out to players because owners can afford that because they own the team. But yeah, w- once you work in the complexities about LTIR, the it's frustrating because you want to say, yeah, if this is happening, it means Eisenman's definitely going for some mega swing or he's definitely lining something else big up. Or it could just be, like you said, Brad, you know, the Illiches don't want to pay out this contract or something with insurance or something boring like that. I don't know. I know it is an, uh, it's an exciting deal and it's an interesting deal. And selfishly, if Tyler Johnson ends up on this team after we already have to go through a wave of Ryan was wrong for thinking that it might happen, that's a little bit of a, uh, a gloating moment for me. Not at all how I expected. Well, I don't think it'd be a gloating moment because if he is going big like Kalorn and Johnson big or if it's like two separate transactions from two different teams I mean that that's a whole nother thing because Tampa like because does losing the Zetterberg contract to Tampa is that viewed as an asset being moved so in how am I, how am I phrasing this does the asking price from Tampa go down because Detroit's unloading a dead contract? So instead of, say, hypothetically getting two first, is that now a first and a third because, hey, we're taking this contract off your hands? Because in reality, if the contract's insured, it's just it's just dead money. Like it just the only hindrance that it has is how much you can go over the cap in the office. Is off-season. it not an asset? Is it not an asset to Tampa, though, because of the No, LTR? it's not. It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. You don't get extra cap relief if you have LTIR. You just get the cap relief for that contract. I could be wrong and I could be misinterpreting how the rule works, but I don't think you get anything above and beyond. Did Toronto not do this like last offseason or the offseason before where they strategically traded for an LTIR player to give them some kind of relief? Mm-hmm. They got relief, but that was because they also sent Garrett Sparks over. So they lost a minor league contract and thus freed up like 750000 because of that. I don't think it had anything to do with the Clarkson contract itself. It was because they unloaded an extra player to Vegas from what I was to understand. I can honestly understand why teams are hiring people specifically for cap construction and compliance to help the GM. Like that is their only job. Yeah, and legitimate because it's it is complicated. And again, who would even think to include like you're so far down the rabbit hole hole when you're like, okay, here's how we make this trade work. We give Tampa a dead six million dollar contract to make it work. But it could make sense because if the Red Wings 
I mean, I don't see how the Red Wings go over 10% over the cap with how much cap room they have right now. I like, I'm just being honest like that to me, that's just a reason why they would do that, but they still have nine and a half million in cap space and they only have to add one more contract to their roster, which they could do for nothing. So you got to assume, let's say they get Johnson and Kalorn that puts them at about 10 million. So that would put them at just about 500,000 over the cap, including Zetterberg. So I don't see how that makes sense. Like, because I don't see where the Zetterberg contract being a hindrance comes in here. Unless, Ryan, you're right, and there is some cap mechanism that allows them extra breathing room, which if there is, I am unfamiliar. But, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, what a confu- mess. it's confusing to me because I don't. I don't see why, unless Eisman's literally planning on bringing in like twenty five million dollars in contracts like this season, I I can't wrap my head around it. Yeah, and, and you know what? It means that contract would mean different things to different teams, like teams who aren't looking for it. Like, let's say there is uh, a mechanism to really make use of that contract. Um, that only means so much to teams who could use any kind of uh salary relief other teams will view it as a hindrance because they're paying out six million dollars cash so it depends on the owners as well it's but you're only paying about that this. six million dollar cash if it's uninsured which i can't see anybody signing that big of a contract uninsured that would just be insane no 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 that's it that that it would be insured but like then you get like i've actually heard of technicalities before where it's like oh does the insurance transfer over like if he's been traded after the injury blah blah, blah. anyways we're not going to get into all of that um regardless uh anything else that we want to cover about that rumor or red wings cap stuff before we jump over to our interview with lauren i got nothing else because it's confusing to me all right, Brad, uh, give the listeners a little intro as to who we're going to be talking to, and then I'll uh, trans- transition us over. Uh, yes, let me do an intro before the intro I did for the interview. That makes sense. Yeah, that's what we do. We- that's what we do. We say, hey, we're about to jump to an interview with Lauren. Have you not listened to any time I've done this? Or I, no, I, I, when you get into your like scripted things, I'm, I'm in another planet. I'm not scripted. listening at all. I don't, <laughs> do you think I type it out? I mean, it sounds scripted, so kudos to you if it's not. You're egging people on and you know it. (laughs) Anyways, so here we have uh, a friend of mine, Lauren Gable, member of Team Canada National Women's Hockey Team, formerly of Clarkson University, currently of the PWHPA, Um, all four foot two, 98 pounds of her. Let's go. All right. With that, enjoy the interview. All right, this is going to be a different interview and for me, quite honestly, a risky interview here. So we have forward for the Team Canada Nationals women hockey team, Patty Kazmaier Award winner as NCAA Female Hockey Player of the Year, Clarkson University's all-time leading scorer, um, proud member of Team Sonnet for the PWHPA. But most importantly, one of the top point getters on last year's winged wheel beer league hockey team, Lauren Gable. And it's risky for me because this is one of the few guests we've ever had on the podcast who's seen me play hockey. So knows everything I say on here is a lie. So Lauren, welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm just going to jump in quickly. Lauren, (laughs) be honest. How many times have you seen Brad on his side of the red line? (laughs) Um, honestly, not a lot. <laughs> All right. Just wanted to clear that, clear the air, Brad. You can go ahead now. The fact that it, her answer wasn't zero is probably more than everybody was expecting, if we're being honest. So Lauren uh, is kind of um, famous at my work as everybody's afraid of her because I run a lot of hockey around town. And when she shows up, she just makes us all look like a bunch of idiots. So every time I, I have some ice, first question I get is Lauren coming. And it's always from the goalies. And, uh... When I say, no, she can't make it tonight, I see the sigh of relief. And when I say yes, they try to figure out how to be on her team. So, Lauren, how are you keeping busy hockey-wise these days? Um, I'm just training four times a week, doing strength and conditioning at Limitless Performance in Kitchener. And then I am on the ice twice a week with Hockey Canada Skills. And then I am on the skating treadmill at G&G Skate Training Center 
which my dad owns. That's also in Kitchener, Ontario. And I am on the Sense Arena, which is virtual reality at G&G, of course, and also doing on ice skills a couple times a week as well at G&G. So you're doing a lot of skills training. So the rest of us are just screwed, eh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, good. I'm glad you own up to it. So obviously about a month ago, uh, maybe a little longer than that, you guys got with the PWHPA got some huge news where um, Secret uh, donated or sponsored for a million dollars, which obviously for the growth of women's hockey was hugely important. What has the general feeling been in the PWHPA since that news broke? Um, I mean, when that news came out, we were obviously very like honored and, and gracious to receive that uh, amount of money. Um, Secret did sponsor us last year. Um, they were a huge part of the reason why we did the so well with the Dream Gap Tour, especially with the two showcases in Toronto. Um, but honestly, like, this donation, our sponsorship is just truly amazing. And um, I don't think we can thank them enough with um, what they have done for us and continue to do for us. And um, I think we'll, we'll always have that opportunity to look back on it and, and really thank them in the end. I know that's awesome. And I guess we should clarify because women's hockey is in a state of, I don't know what the proper word is, flux right now between what's going on with um, the NHL wanting to, but not wanting to jump in. And then the PWHA, PWHPA forming their own association. And like you said, the dream gap tour. And I found with that, there's a lot of misconceptions floating around the general public about what the purpose of the PWHPA is and, and what women's hockey is fighting for with this movement. So as someone who's directly involved with it, how would you describe what's going on to the average hockey fan who's not super involved in the process right now? So we created the PWHPA um, Professional Women's Hockey Players Association in hopes to create a viable and sustainable uh, women's professional hockey league. Um, we're not necessarily looking for the amount of money that men's players make in the NHL, but we're wanting uh, an outcome out of this that we can actually make uh, a living off of. Uh, a lot of the girls in the PWHPA have to work uh, other jobs uh, full-time, part-time in order to make money so that they can continue to play hockey. And a lot of um, players still have to buy their own equipment. So, um, Along with that, I think that we're not just doing this for us, but we're also doing this for generations to come. So all those little girls that looked up to us and, and see us play hockey when they're in the stands cheering us on, that's also for them too. So um, they have that same hope and dream that uh, they can have when they get older. And that can't be understated because I remember when the PWHA or the Dream Gap Tour game was in Waterloo, um, when the family and I came out to watch uh, your team versus uh, Laura McIntosh's team, the entire building was filled with girls minor hockey teams. Like it was crazy. Um, I still remember, I don't know if I ever actually told you the story about when the team was in front of us and you were talking to Mika when you were heading off the ice to intermission and the girls turned around to her and said, how do you know Lord? And she said... She's my best friend. <laughs> and just like with this biggest cocky smirk on her face, but like legitimately the amount of girls that were there was crazy. And now correct me if I'm wrong on one thing, but one of the biggest points that you guys are trying to get right now, obviously a living wage is huge because it's, I can't imagine having to travel to Calgary or Montreal to play a hockey game and then go back to work on Monday morning. Um, one of the things is infrastructure because you want to know where your games are. You have your equipment covered like you're talking and a proper travel schedule so that, A, you're not going to work, but you have the facilities and the needs to actually play in a proper league. Yeah, for sure. Um, especially with like the CWHL um, before it folded, they did have um, obviously the girls had to do uh, work full time jobs in that as well. And. Um, speaking to a few of them, they did say it was really hard, um, you know, when Toronto had to fly to Calgary and then they'd have to come back to work on Monday. 
um, or even like missing work. Uh, sometimes they would have to work a full day and then they'd have to leave that night. Um, so it's a lot. And with that comes recovery and, um, recovery is like a huge part in any athlete. Um, you have to recover properly in order to perform at your best. And, um, say you're jet lagged or, um, you're over, overworking yourself, you're not going to be at your best. So I think infrastructure is a huge thing with the PWHPA and hopefully a future viable, sustainable professional women's hockey league. Um, with that, I'd hope to see, um, you know, you, if I had a game in Calgary, we'd leave a few days before practice there, um, everything like that, get our food, hotel, everything paid for. And, obviously um equipment as well that's a huge huge part of it too now to look at this short term a bit more because obviously the world's ending everything sucks nothing's where it's supposed (laughs) to be um but the pwhpa is still announcing new teams new sponsorships constantly um because you got team sonnet for toronto and i forget the company but calgary just got a big sponsor didn't they for their team yeah team scotia bank team scotia bank correct so what what's the p PW trying to do in the short term in a world where nobody can travel? I think as of right now, we're just trying to promote the PWHPA, um, showing that we can still get sponsorships and people who want to support us, Um, especially during this time. Obviously, nothing's really going on with the PWHPA, but um, I think that This kind of gets us um, going for a hopeful 2021 season, um, if that does happen, and also the following years to come. um, People would be really excited to uh, see us play as they were last year. Um, But, you know, having that feeling of looking forward to watching, you know, Team Sonnet versus Team Scotiabank and really getting for those hopeful games is is a plus. Absolutely. Now, the big question mark in the room with the PWHPA right now is the NHL's involvement, obviously, because the NHL has made it clear they want to get involved in women's hockey, but they've also made it clear they don't want to get involved when there's another league running. Now, the NWHL just went over, uh, they had the ownership changeover, which nobody's really sure how that's going to affect anything. But has there been any more communication or anything publicly available about the NHL's communications with you guys? Um, Honestly, I have not heard anything about that. Um, Only thing we do have is NHLPA. Um, They're on our side and and rooting for the PWHPA, which is really great. Um, Other than that, uh, we haven't heard much as players. Okay, so if if we busted out a crystal ball, and or I shouldn't even say crystal (laughs) ball, a genie lamp, gave it to you right now, and I said you can make one wish about women's hockey. So whether that's the NHL involvement or how that would work, whatever it would be, what's Lauren Gables? Okay, here's what we want in a realistic universe. I would want a, well, I mean, all of us would want a Women's National Hockey League, um, similar to the WNBA, following in their footsteps. And, um, you know, promoting women's hockey is is a huge thing. And uh, as I grew up, I played boys AAA hockey and I was always, oh my gosh, there's a girl on that team. Like, why is she playing boys hockey? She shouldn't be playing boys hockey. And um, that kind of got to me. But at the same time, it, it gave me a lot of fire and um, wanted me to go out there and, and do do great things, obviously. And um, to this day, like, obviously, women's sports is overlooked a lot. And we're trying to break that stigma surrounding surrounding these sports. Um, so hopefully in the future, we can have a women's national hockey league, um, that we would make a sustainable living and we can play the game that we love and play it well, because my, my favorite, (laughs) my favorite type of Twitter troll is the, the average idiot on Twitter, not unlike myself, except just someone else who argues that, well, the women's game is not as good as the NHL, so why should they get all these things? And as you've already laid out, that's not exactly what you're asking for. You're not asking for a $10 million contract. You're asking to play the sport you love at a livable wage. Um, We should actually post a video of one of our shinnies when you come out just to see what happens when a national team member comes out and plays (laughs) with a bunch of beer league idiots because, oh, it's, it's not pretty for the rest of us. 
Uh, You're not making this enticing. Brad constantly asked me to come out and like, <laughs> even before COVID, like I'm, I'm lazy. Like when I stopped playing, like it's really hard to get me on the ice. I felt proud. <laughs> Lauren, before I talked to you, I felt proud because I just got a little badge on my watch because I got on the bike five times this week and now I'm about to throw the watch out. <laughs> I'm not getting on the ice with you guys. <laughs> oh, no. My favorite is we'll be sitting on the bench and we're all sucking air because we're dying. Lauren is absolutely ruining everybody out there she's fresh as can be and then we'll be shooting the shit and she'll mention oh yeah i rode the bike for 30 minutes this morning or 30 kilometers this morning <laughs> so she'll go out and do that and then come out and wreck us do it all with a smile on her face and then i assume go and skate on the treadmill after she's done she's literally showed up in half her gear before because she just got off the treadmill do you know how yeah. that makes me feel about myself lauren <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty rude <laughs> Yeah, I, I actually grew up like I went to high school with Laura McIntosh and she would come out and play with us a bunch and she was just unbelievable. I didn't expect it at all. I was like, oh, yeah, like she's obviously really good. She's a girl, but she like embarrassed almost all of us. So, yeah, it's uh, people just don't give women's hockey the credit it, it deserves. No. Is it on the par with the NHL? No, nothing is. It's the NHL. But is it still high level entertaining hockey? Of course course it is so that's why i always love when you guys can break these misconceptions that everybody has and i mean some of the games the last two women's olympic gold medal games are probably two of the top five hockey games played period in the 20th 21st century like i mean canada came on top of one the u.s came on top of the other we won't talk about that one um, <laughs> but like the games were incredible so i don't know how anybody can sit there and say with a straight face that you guys don't deserve it or because it's not on par with the nhl this is all a waste of time um again you have a platform here with uh, no filter lauren do you have any message to those people <laughs> um <laughs> just on the spot <laughs> honestly um to all those like people out there who don't think women's hockey or women's sports in general aren't as good as men, um, like Brad said, I think if you do think that, you should probably watch a woman's game, and that'll probably change the way you're thinking. Um, along with that, you take Kendall Coyne Schofield, um, who was at the NHL All Star competition. She beat I don't know how many people in that um, skating race. Um, so that just goes to show that men aren't faster than women. I mean, there'll be a lot of men that are, but at the same time, there are more that aren't. Um, I think it's just a huge misconception and people don't really want to put in that effort to watch women's hockey just because there's a surrounding stigma saying that women's hockey isn't as great as men's um, because there's no hitting, there's no fighting. And that's what brings men's hockey um, so much power and greatness. And um yeah, I mean, we do have hitting. Um, sometimes you'll get called, sometimes you won't. The ref will let it go. But um, I think our hockey is is probably a lot faster than um, the men's hockey, in my opinion. One thing that came up for me a lot over time, Lauren, was um, an appreciation for the game without you know constantly comparing it to the NHL level. Like Brad alluded to, there's not really a function in that. Like. We talk about the AHL, we're talking about the SHL, we're talking about all these different leagues, and they don't compare to the NHL at all. You can tell it's a different game, but it doesn't mean we're not out there, you know, having a favorite team or cheering or getting invested in games. Or like the last Olympics, where that wasn't a best on best tournament for the men because NHL players weren't allowed to go. A lot of Canadians and Americans were still really, really invested in that team. So it, it doesn't really matter um, that you're you're getting a best on best tournament or um sorry that you're you're they're not up to the nhl scuff like like you said it's it's a fast pace it's a fun game to watch um and i love the comparison of those two gold medal games brad like i my heart was beating through my chest for both of those it's just exciting hockey so lauren you are aware that in uh when you go to the olympics and what is it 2022 like you, Hopefully, <laughs> your, your team's got some standards to live up to in this gold medal you got to do something to make it crazy <laughs> Like, I've seen you do the through the legs move in, with Shinny's with us like a million times. If you pull that off in a gold medal game, you're going down as a national hero. I just need you to know that. <laughs> like, and I've seen you do it. There's no excuse. It's pretty much the same level and same pace of play. So it should be no problem. Yeah, exactly. No problem like, at all. <laughs> yeah, it's not like you're going to have like one of the Lamaroos or Coin Schofield on your ass on that breakaway, right? You'll have all day. It'll be fine. All day. Easy. 
easy. Like, I mean, the, we had that one when you were in Anaheim. I, that goal looked like nothing. You were fine. <laughs> just, just know that our expectations for you are absurdly high, and if you don't meet them, we're going to be very disappointed. That's just how it works. Understandable. Absolutely. Right? I actually have a, a quick question um, from one of our fans. His name is Cody Stark. It says, Lauren, have you ever played against Jocelyn and Monique Lamaru? Uh, they played uh, men's hockey in uh, North Dakota and le- until they left for uh, Shattuck, and then they kicked the shit out of all of us boys for years. Yeah, um, I did play against them. I think it was in the two-game rivalry series in Pittsburgh. I think they were there. I'm not 100%, but I also played against them in the PWHPA in a couple of the um, Dream Gap Tour stops that we did as well. And they're uh, very good players. Are you able to tell them apart on the ice at all? Honestly, no. (laughs) (laughs) Even off ice, they're, um, (laughs) they're very hard to tell apart. Just a lot of waves and, hey, you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so I've got another off the cuff question. Proudest moment of your career so far, and you have four options. Okay. Okay. One, winning your medal at the 2019 World Championships. B, winning the Patty Kaz as NCAA Player of the Year. Um, C, other, you choose. Or D, scoring a hat trick in the first period in your first beer league game with the Winged Wheel podcast hockey team. <laughs> you don't need to suck up or anything. Do not pick D. Do not pick that one. I'm 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 sorry, Brad, but I'm not gonna pick D. That's the right answer. Um honestly, I would say the proudest moment was um B, uh receiving the twenty nineteen Patty Kazmaier Memorial Award. Um it was just such a surreal moment. Um honestly words can't describe just described how I felt up there on that stage receiving the award um you know being compared to patty and and who she was and the story she she has behind her um is truly amazing and it's such a prestigious award that i'm completely honored and to have my parents there my grandpa my godfather obviously my teammates and coaching staff and support staff was was truly amazing um you know they helped me get to where i am and and where i want to go and um i truly appreciate appreciate that yeah it's, it was kind of a big deal <laughs> kind of a big deal. It made the rounds around here, that's for sure. Um, to get compl- just a little off topic too, because I got to get Evan a little more involved in the conversation here. So you golfed basically a hundred oh, times this summer. Best course of <laughs> golf this year and best score. And I'm going to let Evan take it from there. Oh, great. Um, the probably Rockway that I golfed. I really love that golf course. I yeah, just- me too. I just golf there all the time. Um, my lowest score there was an 84. Okay. But so- I also started golfing la- this summer. Oh. That's- yeah. Are you kidding me? That's unreal. That a joke? <laughs> no, I'm being serious. I got buddy 84 in the for- front nine at Rockway this summer. <laughs> and it wasn't my first. I have people I play with who have never even shot 84 and they've been playing for five, ten years. So that's that's unreal that 84 wasn't when you were out with me and clayton was it actually it might have been because i know you beat me in the fir- the first round we played i got you in the second but you definitely kicked my ass in the first one yeah i think it might have been with you guys yeah i was dying by the end of that because it was like 100 degrees out and again you look like it didn't phase you at all i was ready to throw up by the back well, nine i was also in a cart so yeah, well that's fair <laughs> still still Lauren, I have a question here from uh, another one of our listeners. His name is Arjun Shanker. It says, thanks for taking the time to be interviewed by these three delightful goobers. Uh, two questions, one hockey and one uh, off topic. Oh, no. For the hockey question, what do you think was the most <laughs> important thing you've learned uh, through your player development that helped you keep your composure during high stress moments? And off topic, what was the best thing you've eaten in the last few weeks? <laughs> <laughs> um, so to that first question. Um, I would say that, um, I had to work on my defensive zone. Um, my coach at Clarkson always told me that defense translates to offense, um, which was quite true. Can you give uh, Brad, uh, his email? <laughs> I think Brad needs that. Brad needs your coach's email. It's fine. I'm too far gone. Um, uh, defense translates to offense, um, which showed a lot at Clarkson. Um, I think in high stress moments, I 
uh, it honestly doesn't really phase me. Um, I mean, I, I, when I won back-to-back national championships with Clarkson in 2017 and 2018, um, it was it was really really intense. But I kept my composure on the ice on the bench and um, you know stayed positive and and didn't think anything anything of it. It was just honestly another game and um, you know you play up to your your potential and um, the outcome is is going to be what it's going to be and. Um, yeah, you just you just you just keep a positive mindset and that's all you can do. I mean, it's easy to keep your composure when you're infinitely better than everybody else on the ice, but uh what about the food question? Oh, right, the food question. <laughs> <laughs> the best thing that I've eaten in the last week. Um that's like actually a pretty difficult question. But um I would have to say homemade pizza. Oh, that's good. Glu- that's a gluten, answer. gluten-free, dairy-free. Um, yes, Brad, I saw that. <laughs> you, you, you had me until until the gluten-free and the dairy-free. <laughs> I'm gluten-free and dairy-free. Oh my! It's a God. rough life. It's good. You should try it. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I've worked uh, with dairy-free cheese, and I know how hard it is to melt, and I just ha- have not the patience for that. <laughs> There's actually a very good kind. It's called Earth Balance. Okay, well, I'll give it a try again. You should then. try it. All it right. melts. It melts good. Now that we've said their name, we'll reach out for a sponsorship. <laughs> <laughs> That'll cost them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think we can pick out one more fan question from here. Actually, um, listener Steve E has a, a couple questions. Uh, one is, who's your favorite nation to play against? And two, uh, he says, my two daughters haven't been on the ice since March. How do I reinforce skating skills during quarantine? Um, so I would say that to reinforce skating skills, since your, um, two girls haven't been on the ice, um, I would obviously do some off ice sessions, um, you know, just getting those, um, legs back in motion. Um, if you're somewhere where it's not that cold, I would recommend going on rollerblades. Um, I would also recommend the stick handling a couple hours a day. Um, shooting pucks. When I was younger, I shot 500 pucks a day. Um, I'd make my dad come out with me and make him pick up the pucks. So that's definitely a good recommendation. Um, I'm sorry, what is the first question again? Uh, Your favorite nation to play against. Oh, right. Um, I would definitely say USA. Um, The games against them are always like so intense and um, it's always, it's always great. Uh, It's a great, series against them because there's so much um tension that builds up throughout the games and we've played them so many times that it's kind of like a almost like a tournament for like every single game you play against them um obviously don't like losing against them because they're usa but um yeah they're, those are great games to play in all right um brad do you want to wrap up unless evan you have any additional questions you want to throw at lauren no i'm good All right, I guess I'll just open the floor up uh, to Lauren here to uh, pitch whatever you want to pitch. So if you want to give the listeners one last reason to follow, obviously, the national women's team, the PWHPA, Team Sonnet, whatever you want to pump. Here's here's your window to leave an impression. (laughs) Um, No pressure. None at all. Hey, she already said she's calm and cool under pressure. We're just putting it to the test. Anyone who is listening to this right now, um, it would be great if you could follow the PWHPA on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Um, Through that, you can support women's hockey. Um, Also follow Team Sonnet, which is Toronto in the PWHPA, which is the team that I am on this year. Um, Also follow Hockey Canada and HC underscore woman um, is the Woman Hockey Canada Twitter page. Um, also, if you guys want to sauce me a follow, my Twitter is lgable9 and Instagram is lgable9 as well. Um, so yeah, thank you guys for um, having me on this podcast. It was great. <laughs> oh, you, sure. you sounded like you had to choose your word carefully yeah. there. <laughs> 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 she, she wasn't sure whether to throw her dogs into the page in there or not. Yeah, I that'll be on the follow. Cockapoo. <laughs> you, you can follow him too <laughs> yeah the follow-up interview will definitely have to fe- feature we have a dog tax on this show so yeah absolutely good 
Well, uh, we'll have Lauren tagged on everything. So check the uh, the Twitter post for um, her page specifically, as well as some of what she mentioned. Uh, Lauren, thank you so much for joining us and uh, good luck with everything. And until next time, um, and if we do end up on the same ice together, please remember that I have not played in a long, long time. Take it easy. <laughs> And that was our interview with Lauren Gable. Um, extremely depressing for me. Uh, we should stop having athletes on the show. Um, <laughs> the worst thing that's ever happened to me was Evan introducing the phrase milk bag because it's just so accurate. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 you- yeah, all I can do is nod because it's true. The the benefit of having Lauren on though is is I can actually we can actually use the pros versus Joe's analogy because I I live it every time I'm on the ice with her and all me and my buddies and we're all on the ice together. It's comical. And like we're not even bad hockey players. Like I can say like we're beer league idiots, but like most of the guys we play with have played rep junior, like yeah, they play in my senior A league or something like that. Like these are guys who can play, just not at a professional level. And then you get a professional hockey player out there with us who's legitimately way smaller than us, way faster than us, has a harder shot than us. Her cardio absolutely puts us to shame. It, it's just every time I, I see a, a keyboard hero just go, "Oh yeah, I could have could have done that." Like all those guys with Sarah Fuller right now. Oh yeah, she had an extra point. I could have done that. No, you couldn't have. No, you can't beat these players on the ice no 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 you're an idiot stop it i know i shouldn't have had that popcorn (laughs) while Uh, on the bike yeah um okay we are going to transition to some other news actually um the saga goes on about the zetterberg contract it looks like there there would be some kind of hypothetical cap relief again i'm not going to say for any kind of certainty i've seen seven different answers here so that's why i just say straight up i don't know (laughs) For uh, people who are looking for the Twitter own on either myself or Brad, please have at it for the next week before um, these talks pick up and a trade never happens. Um, okay, the NHL and NHLPA are closer to a an agreement to return. It seems like the NHL has dropped all of its asks for um, financial relief from the players. Um, the players I know responded with some proposals of their own and some ideas of what the NHL could do to make, to incentivize them, you know, further changing the terms of an already agreed upon CBA. Looks like the NHL looked at the response and said, yeah, this fight isn't going to be worth it for us in any way. So let's just drop it. So they're moving forward as is, which is a big relief. It means a, uh, um, Frankly, a, a, a fight that never needed to happen actually won't happen. And they're focusing more now on actually getting the uh, league up and running. Because believe it or not, it is mid-December, which means they have not a lot of time left to get the uh, season up and running if they do want that mid-January start. So uh, the major focus right now is divisional realignment. We've talked about this a little bit before, um, but the proposed divisional realignment that is needs two-thirds um, – Vote approval from the Board of Governor is as follows. Uh, Canadian Division, Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, Winnipeg, Ottawa, Toronto, Montreal, for obvious reasons. Um, the Pacific would be Anaheim, Arizona, Colorado, Dallas, LA, San Jose, St. Louis, which is iffy, and Vegas. Um, the kind of pseudo central would be Carolina, Columbus, Detroit, Chicago, Florida, Minnesota, Nashville, and Tampa Bay. And then the, I guess, the Atlantic would be. Boston, Buffalo, New Jersey, um, New York Islanders, New York Rangers, Philly, Pittsburgh, and Washington. So those are still subject to change. I know there's been a lot of uh, huffing and puffing about where St. Louis is and where Minnesota is and all that. But yeah, that's what we're looking at for a 56-game season. So the Atlantic is the new Thunderdome. And the Central is the opposite of that. The Red Wings might not be as terrible by virtue of getting a lot more games against not elite teams. Yeah, not awful. Like, they're not going to win. They're probably no. still going to be at the bottom. Like Chicago even might f- be worse. Yeah. Look at their goaltending, uh, man. It doesn't take a lot for Detroit's goaltending to be in the same place. But no, I understand what you mean. Like, Detroit has company there. 
Um, Carolina is going to run train on them. Columbus, like even like the Columbus and Florida and Minnesota, whatever you think of those teams are still going to be better than Detroit. But yeah, Detroit's not playing, you know, uh, Tampa Bay every single night. They're not going to be playing Washington every single night. They're not going to be playing Philly every single night. So it's. Well, they lost, they've lost Boston. They've lost Toronto. Those are certainly going to help. Um, and man, say what you want about Carolina and. Nashville coming in, they're not as good as those teams. Um, I don't want to play Carolina a ton. No, like I, no, I, I, I know Carolina has Detroit's number, but I'm just saying on paper they're not as strong. Um, Pittsburgh was rumored to be in this division, and they're not, so that was a happy avoidance. I mean, looking at this division, there's a realistic chance Tampa goes 56 and 0. I'm just saying. Uh, Minnesota on paper is a bad team this year. Chicago is a bad team. Nashville has a ton of cap space and has not improved. Nobody really knows what they're doing right now. So they're not the powerhouse that they have been. Again, I'm with you. Detroit's not good. They're not going to be good. I mean, but they play Columbus tough usually for whatever reason, even though Columbus is very good. I mean, it's only going to be, they're only proposing a 56 game season, but looking at this division, I can say comfortably the Red Wings are going to win more than 17 games. Like even despite playing 14 less games than last year, they should win more games than they won last year. A, because last year was ungodly. Um, And two, because I mean, you're going to take a couple from Minnesota. You're going to take one or two from Nashville. And Nashville is actually one of the, good teams detroit has their number for whatever reason they're gonna win games against chicago uh, they're gonna take one or two from columbus so like it adds up um again i'm not optimistic i i know i was joking about detroit might make the playoffs if the division's bad enough but i don't think it's crazy to think detroit finishes fifth in this division because i can see a reality where they finish ahead of minnesota and chicago again not betting on it but i can see that reality yeah, the season is more of a sprint than a marathon this year, so there could be some teams that come out really, really slow, and that could make all the difference. Like, the sample size will be smaller, and I don't think this team is good. But you never know. They they, they may finish higher than expected, whatever you think expected is. There's always a chance in shortened seasons. And especially in a shortened season where you can ride flukes. Let's not forget that it was... Less than two se- – like not this past season, the season before, Detroit went what? On a 7-1-2 and two run because uh, the Bertuzzi-Mantha-Larkin line just went insane and seemed to score like four or five goals a game. Um, last year, Jonathan Bernier went on a couple heaters. I mean, if that top line clicks and their goaltending is even halfway decent, they're going to steal games. Again, not enough to get into the playoffs in all likelihood, but they'll steal games. And thankfully, the way the draft's shaping up this year, it's not the worst year if we p- end up picking 6th, 7th, or 8th unexpectedly. Um, so, you know, it, it, a shortened season, a weird new division with teams we don't typically see that often, and a draft where it's not critical that we win the draft lottery. We might actually be able to have some fun with this season as fans, which is going to be a nice relief from the last few years. We're not going to live and die with every loss we're not going to live and die with every win. We're going to, you know, see them jump off the playoffs. Maybe they're playing meaningful games into the 40s this year. Again, not to make the playoffs, but if they're still, quote unquote, in the hunt two thirds of the way through the season, that's going to be a hell of a lot more fun than it was last year, even if it's a long shot in the hunt. I mean, it, it's shaping up that this season might not be a disaster, which. I mean, say what you want about maximizing draft spot, and I'm sure we're going to say that a lot this year. But, you know, there is something to be said for building some confidence. This could be a good year for the Red Wings to do that. Win some games, steal some teams, jump a few spots in the standings, and and maybe get some more morale going in the room. And then trade away the players you don't plan on re-signing, keep the UFAs you do plan on re-signing, and... And you got a better, clearer outlook for the future with players who are happier to be here. So uh, the current goal is to start on January 13th with a 56 game season. Leaves a lot of questions still. You know, how many players are teams going to be allowed to carry? Are they going to have a taxi squad? Um, What's the scheduling going to look like? What's going to happen to those teams that got burned by both um, the draft lottery and the expanded playoffs? The seven 
eight, seven teams. Um, do they still get their bonus training camp? Um, a couple other points here I see brought up by uh, Scott Burnside actually um, on the athletic is um, uh, opt outs. What's going to happen with opt outs? And then, you know, what backup plans do they have for these kind of dates? And, and the what's the is there going to be a bubble in the playoffs? It, there's a whole myriad of things, which is why the story is ongoing. So as this develops, I'm sure this will be a main topic as well next week. But fingers crossed by next week, we have an agreement in place and we are guaranteed that by January 13th, the NHL will be starting back up. Um, okay. The quickly before overtime here, um, world junior rosters have been announced. Cuts have been made. COVID lists have been put out. Unfortunately, certain players, um, actually more players than you would want, um, are missing the tournament due to COVID. But uh, the Red Wings ended up with seven pr- uh, prospects picked for the World Juniors. Um, on Team Red Wings, uh, Sweden, sorry, uh, Lucas Raymond, uh, Theodore Niederbach, Elmer Soderblom, Albert Johansson, and Gustav Berglund. So obviously, if you're a Red Wings fan, tune into every Team Sweden game you possibly can. Um, and then watch Raymond and Holtz terrorize the other teams while they're on the ice together. Uh, Emil Vero, defenseman for Finland, uh, made that team, which is um, really great, honestly. And then Jan Bednar, a, the goaltender, made the Czech team. So seven uh, Red Wings prospects, 11 camp invites, which is really good. Um, you know, notably missing from Team Sweden, of course, is William Wallander, who, due to a p- positive COVID test, uh, wasn't able to play. So really, we're looking at a limited uh, representation of what the Red Wings could have had at this World Juniors. Well, uh, Wallander tested positive, so he was out. Albin Greva tested positive, so he was also out. And I don't know if it's because he tested positive or if it was just the protocol, but Robert Master Simone was a strong bet to make the American team as well, and he was forced out as well. So there could, there should have arguably been 10 Red Wings there uh, instead of seven, but that's the world we live in. Um, the one plus is Carl Henriksen also uh, – was forced out of Sweden due to his test, but Niederbach has now seen um, some time in camp on that top line between Raymond and Holtz. So that's a plus. Uh, he didn't make it, but Donovan Sabrango was a real long shot to make it uh, team Canada, but he, he was the last among the last cuts, the last group of players cut. So, I mean, he went a lot farther in Team Canada's camp than was expected. And by all accounts and reading the reports of the reporters who were there, he played well. He forced Team Canada's hand to keep him around as long as they did, Um, not counting the two-week quarantine, obviously. But, I mean, overall, it was a really, really positive sign for the Red Wings in the camps. Now the guys who made it just need to show out in the tournament itself. Yeah, Uh, and the tournament itself needs to run with, you know – good structure and proper protocol in place. I know there's been a lot of discussion to say the least surrounding that so far. So hopefully it can go off without a hitch. I know team Sweden has had to replace coaches, um, you know, because of uh, COVID and traveling over pretty much the players are assuming like there, there's, they're assuming the risk and there's not as much organization as you'd want by all accounts. So hopefully that all gets sorted out and they can play this safely and, uh, properly and that we don't see some kind of um disruption in the tournament so i personally selfishly really looking forward to it it's a staple of the holidays for me christmas day is great boxing day um means the world junior starts so uh more to come on that uh anything else guys before we jump into overtime here okay overtime i was gonna say the echl started up this week oh did it actually I think Toledo's not in it, but they're going to be joining mid-January. Sports are weird. Sports are in such a weird yeah, it's place. It's kind of weird that a team can just join into the league <laughs> partway through the season, but you know, weirder things have happened this year. Yeah, they just give you a 10-point credit when you uh, walk through the front door. That's what the Red Wings are going to do. <laughs> yeah. We'll just join halfway through, you know, give us, just put us in the middle, we'll figure our way out. It's like a rebuy in poker. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, all right, we're going to jump into overtime, which is uh, brought to us by our Patreon supporters. Um, 
you guys are the reason why we're able to continue the show in the off season, uh, do cool stuff and talk hockey. So I uh, appreciate you guys. And we're, we are going to start out with our Patreon comments with Mike Franklin it says, what are your favorite goalie helmets of all time? I used to collect just goalie cards as a kid. So I'm partial to the nineties era. Love Trevor kid on the flames or Felix Potvin Blaine Lat locker bring Blaine Latcher locker locker. Uh, might be my favorite of all time though. Jim Carrey, the net detective, will not tolerate this disrespect. Um, Dominic Hashix made me so angry until it actually grew on me. And then when I saw someone else in net, it annoyed me. So I'm a big fan of the Dominator's helmets. I mean, if we're talking like just straight up masks, Eddie Belfour is all time. Eddie the Eagle. Come on. That, that mask one in is Kudrow's mask the two that I thought of immediately. I mean, I grew up in the 90s, so those were the two that were like the masks in the 90s. And who was it? Brian Hayward's with the Sharks, that ridiculous one. Oh, right. I remember classic. that one a little bit. Uh, Darren Helm Stan Club says, hey, Ryan, I was hoping this comment would be full of bragging and boasting about the inevitable team up north losing by 40. Instead, we might must wait another 340 ish days until then. It's the not the and just know where there where there is an OH, there is an IO soon to follow. Harbaugh's job is safe for the time being. Thankfully, go Bucks. (laughs) The torture big talk for someone who didn't even score any points on us this weekend. (laughs) <laughs> uh ooh, it's a good one ghost of podcast pass says hey remember about four years back when you said that riley shayan is a really good second line center yeah. compared to the rest of the league definitely the best third line center in the league if that's where blash Hill plays him and then he went on to score zero goals for the first 81 games of the season <laughs> yeah you generally tend to have higher hopes for first round picks than that but here we are <laughs> <laughs> if Shane was on the team this year, what position would he play? He gets around 10 goals a season, FYI. Uh, oh, center purely because line of a center, lack of Maybe it. actually second line center. <laughs> I think I still like Nemesnikov better than him, but oh boy. Yeah, he'd be comfortably on that third line center spot. Uh, Michael Thompson says, with watching the latest Hot Ones with Daniel Radcliffe, he was asked about his love of American football and went further to say how he's become a huge hockey fan and his partner is from Detroit and a huge Red Wings fan. That got me wondering, what Hogwarts house do you think some of your favorite players, coaches, and prospects that can be current or past would be sorted into? Uh, I'm a Harry Potter guy, so this one's all you I was going to say, I think this is a Ryan question because I have no idea. Well, now I don't want to answer because I seem like a dweeb. But yeah, you already are. So just answer. (laughs) Larkin's definitely a Gryffindor. Bertuzzi's definitely a Slytherin. Um, I'm just trying to think of players. Who's your favorite player of all time, Evan? Marty McSorley. Okay, I'll give you one. Steve Ott. You know, you would almost want to say like the the easy answer here is that Steve Ott is a Slytherin, but I don't think that's the case. I think Steve Ott's a, a Hufflepuff. Steve Ott's like, what house is the one where the people do, you know, maybe harmful things, but everybody appreciates what they do? Is there a specific, is that a trait that any of the houses? <laughs> harmful in what way? I don't know. Like, everybody Physical. really hates Steve Ott, but when he's on your team, you really like him. Oh, uh, yeah, it's Slytherin. Like, they're evil, but they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't know. This is way outside my my world. It's probably there's probably more content here to be had if either of you read a book growing up. No, thank you. Um, Adam Kauser and Adam, I saw when you commented this and it has not left my brain all day. Uh, gummy worms have more bones in them than actual worms. Why do I know that? <laughs> that is something I did not expect. I don't know. I don't. Today. Dis- They're made of gelatin, which uh, is. Ah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what? That's I agree with Brad. I ha- I almost wish I didn't hear those words in that order. <laughs> I feel like I feel like I've unlocked a a part of consciousness that I had no plans of ever venturing into. Uh, AJ Voss says my reaction to us claiming Timoshov off waivers. Okay. My reaction to us trading Timoshov to the Islanders. Okay. It's probably not, but I hope the future considerations are some kind of groundwork for a future trade involving us taking on cap for the Islanders. Uh, Michael Barry says, Ryan, how responsible do you feel about all the world junior players in the Red Wings system getting cut or getting COVID after bragging about how many wings were in this tournament? Are you going to pin that on me? 
Really? I concur. It's all Ryan's fault. <laughs> right. This is Ryan's fault is a funny meme, but I think the pandemic is a bit much. Well, the pandemic is Ryan's fault. <laughs> Garrett TV says, what's your favorite swear word and why? Oh, man. Fuck. It's got to be. It's just so... It's it's not so crass where you can't use it. Uh, uh, assuming you're talking in a space where it's okay to use it, don't do it in emails. Um, enough, but it still has the oomph behind it, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to pick a creative one, but I drop so many f bombs in my day to day life on purpose and accidentally. I I can't not pick it. That is by far the most used swear word in my life. Yeah. It's not even close. Yeah. It's um I saw I saw a tweet that said uh, is it for fuck's sake or fuck's sakes? First of all, it's the former, it's fuck's sake. Um and then- I too saw that TikTok. Thank you, Hank Green. Was it a TikTok or tweet? I I saw it as a tweet and it If said, it was Hank um, Green, I saw it as a TikTok. If that's the one you're referring to. And they said, uh, what's it called? They were like, uh, I need to know for professional reasons it's going in an email or something like that. And I laughed. <laughs> um, okay. Next question from Brad Crystal, Methco, Crystal, and Ryan Hanna brand Wings and Pizza. And Kevin Bob Slinger, Sun Life Drone. Says, hey guys, I'm kind of excited this year for my birthday on Monday. It's shocking. Haven't liked a birthday in a few years. I'm 27. I feel old. Send help. Thank you guys for making this year more enjoyable with your crazy shenanigans. At least we have a, an official date for hockey and see a team off. It was a nice four or so games. Well, happy early birthday. Um, thank you for your always colorful comments and um, what you lack in commas, you make up for in humor. So I appreciate that. <laughs> uh Anakin Thighwalker says, peak off-season thoughts, which is worse, the 2017 draft or the ever-increasing role of art? Oh, <laughs> yeah, man. Some people don't like art. Uh, the 2017 draft, man, hurt a lot. It yeah. hurts a lot to look back at. Given that it wasn't the strongest draft, I don't think it was devastating. It's not like – I mean, obviously not picking Suzuki or Nichash hurts. Uh, there's still hope for Rasmussen. We always need to reiterate that. Do I think he'll be as good as them? No. Do I think he can still be a good NHLer? Yes. Um, yeah, like it's not like there was a Larkin or a Pasternak pick behind him, which helps. But yeah, that was for how many picks they had and where they picked. That, that was a big oof. Um, Tyler C says, if I buy the hot sauces, will you do a hot ones mock draft? It's on YouTube if you haven't heard of it. Yeah, Evan actually brought this idea up. Well, I think we ha- we have to do it now. Put it to my veins. I'm ready. I told you guys what the stipulation was. We have to like do it as like a reward for our patrons to watch us suffer. So we'd have to like once we hit X amount of patrons, we'll do a hot ones version, a WWP hot ones. Um, I like I'll- spicy food, but I hate it once it gets past the certain certain threshold. So this will go poorly for me. I'll do it next Sunday. I'm not even scared. <laughs> we have no topics. <laughs> For next Sunday, yeah. Evans okay. just gonna put tomato sauce on everything and not tell us. No, I I will suffer suffer for the greater enjoyment of other people. Like yeah, I've watched we'll a lot to. of hot ones. I feel like I could probably pretty comfortably get through a third to half, and then I would just struggle. The problem is the pain keeps building and it exactly. keeps snowballing and it, it compounds, only gets hotter. Yeah, you have yeah. the pain you already have, and then you're adding even more intense pain. It's like starting like it'd be like jumping in a fire on fire and then jumping in a volcano yeah (laughs) yeah you're on fire so that's how you plan on putting it out just to make it worse um la plata peak says if minnesota is the team in the wings division instead of st louis or dallas i think it could vault detroit ahead of the last two of the two last place teams in the western division and maybe even teams like ottawa or buffalo in the final standings it's weird how something like that could be the difference between us picking in the top five to picking between eight and ten in 2021 without the wings making any additional moves this offseason um yako ruta says one of my favorite stories about hockey and pests is when avery was about to say something to sakic and brett hall grabbed him and said uh, you haven't earned the right to talk to mr Sa- mr sakic do you know of any similar stories that's like the the hallmark one i love old story it's not like a similar like respect your elder story but i love the ones of uh, brett hall and pavel datsuk trying to talk 
And Hall would say something, and Datsuk would just smile and nod because he could not speak a lick of English. It was a great line, though. Yeah, I don't know um, any specific lines outside of that one. I, there's probably thousands of them that we don't know about, but yeah, that's the only one I know. Uh, Evan Beckner says, hey, guys, sappy post incoming. Uh, it says, I wanted to thank you guys for keeping this podcast going through this dumpster fire of a year. Like many people, I was laid off when COVID started hitting hard and things got pretty tough for a long time. It's difficult to keep your mental health in a good spot when everything around you seems like it's falling apart. Uh, but I always had this podcast to escape to a couple times a week. Listening uh, to you chuckleheads talk hockey helped me uh, keep the lows from getting too low. And that's why I never ended my Patreon sub despite the lack of employment. I'm happy to announce I finally have a new position. That's actually a decent step forward in my my career and as soon as i can i'm upping my pledge proud to see what you guys have done uh with this podcast over the years you went from censoring jokes to interviewing legends uh once again thanks so much for just keeping things normal in a really weird year p.s shut up brad wow um mainly because of that last line um <laughs> that was extremely touching Evan. no seriously um we're happy we could um bring some sense of normalcy or comfort uh, in a year that was weird for everyone, including us, we didn't know going into this what we would do. Um, so thank you all for giving us the opportunity to just kind of let us do something normal, too. So um, happy it worked both ways, Evan. And congratulations on the step forward in your career. That is and again, dope. the shut up, Brad sentiment is easily the best part of this. Uh, Stay Fresh Cheese Bags of Fournier Company says, hey there, fellows, uh, after looking through Cap Friendly's list of potentially uh, strapped teams, the bailout of Cap Strap team game is done. I don't want anyone's shitty players for what we would get. Probably why those late night rumors of a possible three-way trade with Tampa and Long Island fell through. By the way, I stayed up most of the night for that shit to drop, and it never did. I'm still recovering. I've learned to not try to anticipate the Red Wings late night trades. They come when you're not expecting it. Yeah, go to bed it's early. Like that way if you have to wake up in the middle of the night to tweet about it, you've already banked the extra sleep. Yeah. Yeah. Leave out some cookies for uh Eisman Claus and then that's it. He'll come when you're asleep. Uh a little disappointed about Timashaw's departure, especially after watching him deke Sebastian Aho right out of his skates. But wasn't he planning to head back to Europe anyways? Yeah, that was one of his options. And I think he might see a little bit more cash slash playtime there before trying to come back. Um, also, have you checked out Matt Larkin's recent projected Seattle lineup? His pick for Detroit or for Seattle to select from Detroit, Troy Stetcher, stay fresh cheese bags. I get why Stetcher would be there. We've talked about it, but that, that wouldn't be my pick. I would have him protected as of right now, unless Danny DeKaiser absolutely blows our socks off this year. Yeah. Yeah. That being said, I could see a reality where the Red Wings say, screw it, just protect Hronik, Cholosky, and Lindstrom, and just be like, yeah, well, these guys might not be as good, but we'll have them for 10 years. So, uh, Dylan Stubenrock says, as far as I can tell, the Wings have no promising future goaltender. Where do you think this team goes to in the next few years to fill that position when they start to be competitive and make a playoff push? Is it Jesper Wallstedt? No. Maybe No. Maybe if you're talking maybe. About right in the like seven to nine range, maybe, 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 right? It's not crazy. I see this as way more likely than the Askarov thing. And that thing had legs. It depends where Detroit's picking, like as boring of an answer as that is. If the Red Wings are picking in the top five, I'm not even sniffing, taking a goalie, no matter how good Wallstead is. Um, but yeah, if we get closer to 10, I wouldn't hate it. I know Prashant, I'll get a text from Prashant about that one, but I'm just saying. Uh, the Caminator says, back in January, my fiance and I went to Dallas to watch the Wings play the Stars. Watching a game at American Airlines Center was awful. There was no energy in the building, and we could have had a conversation at speaking volume during play. Based on that, what is the worst professional arena you've seen a game at and why? So I'm not going to dump on the arena or the fan base because there's context behind it, but the most boring NHL game I went to in terms of fan interaction was in New York at MSG, but that was a mid-season Tuesday night game against a non-conference team in the Predators in which the Predators kicked the shit out of the Rangers. It was like 5-1 or something like that. So that place was like a morgue, but given the circumstances around it, I get it. Uh, when the Rangers did score their one goal, they get pretty loud. So, I mean, every building I've been to has been fun. Um, Toronto could do more for how 
big they are, but it was still good. Montreal was unreal. Buffalo is always fun. Detroit's obviously fun. Um, I want, I do want to get back to MSG though for a proper game against a better team to see what it's really like. Since Man. you said the worst professional arena, I'll go with the Sky Dome or oh, Rogers God. Center now. What hey, might dumb. Might, might not have to worry about that for too much longer. Yeah, I saw that they're thinking about tearing it down and building something up right there, which only MLSE could afford. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's in the summer with the dome open, and since it's all concrete, it's just hot and humid and disgusting, and you just, it stinks. And when they have the roof closed, it's hot, humid, gross, and it stinks. So, and it it it's dead in there 95% of the year, so it's awful. All right, we have time for one or two things from Reddit. Um, Evan, red, orange, green, or blue? Pick one. Green. All right, see? I found a way around. And I wasn't ready. The, yeah. Uh, this one's from Cross Crease Pass. Oh, okay. Uh, Cross, Cross Crease Pass is asking if we would ever have the ladies from Access Hockey Michigan on the podcast. Yeah, we actually had a plan. Uh, I was chatting with Rachel. We were going to have them on, talk about hockey, and um, then the world ended. Um, but she's on there on the list for um, things we have to kind of circle back to once hockey picks back up and it's um, those topics are relevant again. But yeah, thank you for bringing that up. And lastly, Nerf Airstrike Commander says, put on your overly critical boss cap and answer this one. What's Eisenman's worst move as a GM so far? <laughs> Regula for Perlini because Perlini didn't work out. He, he didn't anticipate his coach using him how he did. And not that Regula is a game breaker, but he's still a decent prospect uh, we would like to have in the system. That's the easy answer. And that's the one I agree with. If someone wants like a wild card answer that you can argue for, honestly, if you cared, Phil Below's contract. It's not even bad. Like it, it, it's if you consider the context of what he was brought in to do, it's of course not bad. No one actually is upset about that. But I don't know. I actually don't even know. I don't even buy that one because I think he's been like he's not been a good player by NHL standards, but he was essentially sent there to be a warm body that can play some semblance of the center position. And that's what he does. Yeah, because look at who the alternatives would have been. <laughs> so it it was fine. His worst move is not finding a way to magic away Franz Nielsen's contract. <laughs> so far. Um, okay. With that, we're going to wrap up this episode. Uh, we would like to thank all of you for listening. Um, we're going to keep you guys posted as to when we're going to flip back to two weeks uh, as we have more news about the season. Uh, but for now, we are going to thank all of our listeners, all of you who subscribe, you know, iTunes, Spotify, um, uh, Google Podcasts wherever you get your podcasts those of you who leave ratings for us thank you so much our patrons our name level sponsors on patreon arjun shanker kyle ra hi brad uh, zach spring citizen high five cody stark greech jeremiah dobo jake Kiefer, brad crystal meth co ryan hannah Went, brand wings and pizza and kevin bobslinger the sun life drone uh, andrew bohan scott martin jacob turner matt mckay craig kibble brandon m matthew m rice luke johnson kaylin wood hassam al uh charlie elkins hana lee josh yelton trevor pebavar evans bingo card ashley van conant connor leighton danny jr matthew keeler simon anderson stay fresh cheese bags fournier company antonio gracias john evans uh joseph uh minima brand new name level sponsor thank you uh quaz and stan olson thank you guys so much and take care thanks for tuning in to the winged wheel podcast be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com where you can subscribe to the show on itunes spotify or wherever you get your podcasts you'll also find links to other ways to support the show such as patreon official podcast apparel and more and don't forget to follow the show on twitter at winged wheel pod and of course the hosts at brad crisco at ryan hannah wwp and at hockey town evan